Hello once again, guys and gals of the movement world. Week 11, second installment now of Jonathan Taylor. Uh, week 11 movement play of the week. His fourth out of five touchdowns. Obviously, in installment one, we dove into his second touchdown. Um, for those of you out there who are interested in seeing all five of his touchdowns, yes, count them one, two, three, four, five. Um, you can go ahead and do so on the blog post itself uh, and see the video that the NFL uh, released of it. I would also actually invite you to take a peek at a number of Jonathan Taylor's highlights because I think what you will find is that even when we look at just one play or, or two plays in this case, uh, obviously in the case of today with Jonathan Taylor, we're never going to be able to tell the complete movement problem solving story. Remember, what we're attempting to do is really dive into the most dexterous displays and expressions of movement skill, uh, the ways that movement skill is actually um, being organized and controlled and coordinated in the context of maybe the more chaotic movement problems, but in a really functionally fit fashion, in a really integrated way uh, where you can really uh, where we can really highlight together rather um, this constant reciprocal mutual relationship between a dispositional problem and the behavioral organization of the movement skill which emerges. And so we're not really going to take a whole lot of time here on this video to dive into the organismic constraints of Jonathan Taylor because we kind of did so in that first installment. Uh, remember, he is from Wisconsin, second year guy uh, out of um, Wisconsin, but uh, now plays for the Indianapolis Colts, number 28. Some of the strengths that I alluded to in the past that he has displayed in the past that I alluded to in the first video, the first installment, orient around his ability to put his foot in the ground and get north and south and to really find gaps, perceive gaps, um, and select to act upon those respective gaps. Um, really, obviously, when the field gets condensed, such as it is here, first and goal from the 10, um, now in the red zone, once that field space gets condensed, it really is about making guys miss within tight spaces. And, and we're really about to see that here today as well. Um, a few other things that I want to mention is, as I alluded to in the first installment, the meteorologists actually got this one right. They called for a 100% chance of precipitation, 100% chance of rain. And that drizzle started to come down at around halftime and then quickly turned into rain, obviously changing this field turf here in Orchard Park, Buffalo, New York, um, at the home of the Buffalo Bills. Now we see that there's five and a half minutes to go in the third quarter. The game is pretty well in command at this point by the Indianapolis Colts. However, with the parity that exists in the National Football League and, and some of the rules and task constraints, actually a 17-point gap really isn't all that much. So Indianapolis is actually trying to pour it on here. They keep their foot to the gas pedal, much like uh, old Jonathan Taylor will here as well, as he is about to score his fourth out of five touchdowns. But with that rain, with those environmental constraints, come some constraints in the channeling of the movement behavior from not only Taylor himself, but both parties, meaning the opponents as well. So on both sides of that problem and solution dynamics in, that is going to be unfolding, we want to make sure that as movement skill aficionados here, uh, within our own concept of what's really channeling the emergence of movement behavior, we have to think about how this constantly changing, continually changing environment where before it was just overcast um, and now the drizzle has turned into rain. The, the rain on this field turf is going to change the surface and what it affords to players. And we have to think about how that may, that constantly changing environment may lead to constantly changing perceptions intentions and actions as well. Essentially, as Jacobs and Michaels in 2007 would have alluded to in their paper on direct learning, which extends the idea of one perceiving directly and their movement system sort of in this continual state of attunement, intentionality, and calibration. And when the surface changes, especially in the short period of time or any environmental constraint for that matter, changes, we're going to see the more skillful movers calibrate 
aspects of what they perceive and how they intend to act and then how they connect to the information in the world. Maybe not only with that, which what is changing, say, from opponents, but in this case, the surface and what it affords, um, the plantability, if you will, uh, of said surface. The one thing I will say uh, about this constantly changing environment is the way to gain more skill or to facilitate the ability to handle it is obviously to become exposed to it. So one of the things that we'll talk about a little later when we talk about that facilitation of movement skill is the exposure to the environment in a constantly changing one at that. Um, I know I've talked about this a bunch at Football Beyond the Stats, but a number of years back, we started to do a lot where not only were we uh, pre preparing, practicing, training within an environment that was bringing maybe precipitation or an inclement nature. Um, but we also wanted to be existing in a place where the environment was changing throughout the session, much like it will within the game here. Um, the other thing that we see is the more skillful, the more dexterous movers, obviously, as I've said before, um, shout out to Nikolai Bernstein, this idea of dexterity being about the ability to solve any emerging movement problem in any situation, such as problem disposition, but in also any condition. So as those conditions change, and that emergent problem is going to change as well. So all things for us to think about here, all things th that become highly pertinent to Jonathan Taylor, coordinating, controlling and organizing his movement solutions in the fashion that he does. Uh, obviously, as I did before, um, you know, we'll highlight Taylor here about to take the ball from uh, Carson Wentz yet once again. Um, there are a number of things that, that we should probably point out here uh, or put a, put a stamp on. Uh, this individual right here, number 39, uh, Levi Wallace for the Buffalo Bills, is going to be a highly pertinent source of information for this first local micro movement problem. We also have a key interaction here in here. Okay. Um, this obviously uh, is his teammate, tight end number 81, Mo Alley Cox, and then uh, number 21 for the Buffalo Bills here, uh, Jordan Poyer. Um, but what we're going to see as this unfolds, all of those specifying information sources become relevant in specifying affordances to act through a simultaneous and successive fashion. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, if we look at this and I get my mouse back going here, if we, once we play this through, you're gonna see some of these things become very obvious really quickly. Like we have in other videos, uh, before I get myself going too far uh, ahead, let's go ahead and uh, play this if I could. And obviously you can see we're already at 50% speed. So, um, we're, we're going to go ahead and maybe watch it in full speed uh, at the end today, uh, or in this video rather than at the beginning. Um, so watch this kind of play out, watch those information sources, and what specifying information they may be providing to Taylor here that would regulate his movement coordination and control through. So we see it there from uh, obviously the sideline view first and foremost. Uh, let's see if I can get ahead here uh, so you guys don't have to sit through some of the, the BS fluff that is sandwiched in between here. And as we uh, go on ahead, we're, we're going to see it from another viewpoint, another vantage point, which is, as we're going to hopefully highlight later on, is going to provide some things for us. You can see the rain has, that has given some mist even here over the camera. Some really cool nuances that we're about to see uh, from Jonathan Taylor. Boom, just yet another one. Um, there's going to be a lot here to unpack. And in doing exactly that, we, we kind of fast forward to him taking the ball. Obviously, like I, like I mentioned, if I can get my spotlight mouse here, this interaction, this dyadic relationship essentially forms from a complex systems perspective, a triadic relationship along with Taylor, because how Taylor acts in kind of a Bruce Lee fashion, the highest technique, there's no technique, my movement is a result of your movement. Taylor's movement is going to be dependent on that which what unfolds in this interaction, okay? I know, intuitively obvious here, 
but I don't think we look at this in training nearly as much as we should, okay? To have not only opponents present to create a live movement problems, which will channel certain affordances or present certain affordances, which then channel certain movement behaviors or certain movement problem solving perceptions, cognitions, and actions, but also teammates, teammates getting in those opponents ways teammates also presenting shared affordances for the ball carrier in this case the evader the agility mover right so how ali cox interacts with number 21 poria here um what we what we find from taylor is that he is going to behave in a way that keeps him in this metastable region long enough to gain accurate information detection from it. Notice the interpersonal distance here, kind of an optimal distance that then creates this metastable region for this triadic system and the interactions and relations of them. When I say it's a metastable region, I want you to think about this here from Jonathan Taylor, number 28, the running back uh, standing firmly, uh, kind of planting firmly on the 14 yard line. He could do any number of things in order to keep himself in this zone and in this region to make the most accurate decision based on the information he's picking up, mainly from this interaction. But obviously, there's a bunch of other players here as well that he is keeping him, uh, his options open. He's open and responsive to being able to behave in any number of ways. And that to me is really the practical relevance of this metastable region. Maintaining the ability to act in any number of ways until you are sort of channeled into the best decision based on what the world offers you. So once he sees that Ali Cox is pushing 21, the defender here, the wannabe tackler, into this traffic, into this mess, he then plants his right foot hard, just pushes himself out um, into this uh, really controlled, again, a, a movement ownership uh, being personified here by Taylor, not only on at, at this moment in time, but really throughout the course of this entire play, that evolution and maturity shows up because a lot of time young running backs get themselves forced up into there. So if I'm going to just draw on here for a moment, if I could, they get themselves forced up into say maybe this area. And you get at the brink, the end of the brink, the end of the bandwidth, if you will, in regards to the interpersonal distance, and you reduce your options, you constrain your options for how you could potentially move to get up out of it. That to me is where this meta stability kind of comes into play. So at this moment, Taylor is still able to move from right to left to go from a right footed plant pushing over into his left in more of a, a really kind of speed pseudo power cut type of fashion, right? But those individuals who are more adaptable likely have more abundance. And that abundance could mean that he could cut from right to left in this speed power cut fashion. He could cut from right to left in maybe a power cutting fashion where that left foot would come down underneath him. And then that right foot would cross over, maybe giving himself more. Let me see if I can get my spotlight mouse back. Um, getting himself to push more this way, okay, uh, towards the boundaries. Um, or he could, if, if this interaction changes in some way, okay, between 21 and 81, and, and 21 gets a push up in here, now, all of a sudden, Taylor could still be in this metastable region where maybe he could spin, maybe he could uh, jump cut, all, uh, any number of things, whatever really is at his disposal in his action capabilities, within his action capabilities or his movement toolbox, if you will. Hence the reason why movement abundance, especially in weather changes, becomes highly relevant for us to think about. But once this interaction has gotten shored up, I want you to kind of look at what we might be finding from Taylor. Look at him right here, even before that point. Um, oh, shoot. Come on. Sean on the mouse here. Sean on the mouse. Okay. Look right now. Look at where he's looking. Okay. I know, guys and gals, it's highly speculative, right? Because again, we don't have eye tracking 
goggles on here so we can't say for certain this is what he's picking up at this moment in time and this is what it's equated to but we can speculate when we're trying to tell this movement problem solving story when we are trying to put ourselves within the human movement system in its composition process of that integrated movement solution perceptions intentions and actions we it leads us at least in this day and age in 2021 to speculate on some things but look at how Number, number one, what he likely is picking up, and it might not even be there. It may be more like so. So he can gain, and notice I changed that nuance ever so slightly. Um, he is trying to now, he's not zeroing in on one particular part. Like if you look at the spotlight, it's not like he's looking right here, right? Because obviously as one becomes more perceptually skilled, that perception does gain some resolution at key times. When I say resolution, I mean getting a clear understanding of one specific source of energy. It's one specific source of information, right? But also as one becomes more perceptually skilled, more attuned, if you will, more sensitive, that perception, as Gibson would say, becomes wider, longer, and deeper. So he's able to stay attuned or sensitive to a wider range of information that would differentiate what is unfolding in the problem's disposition for him. This is a significant distance here, obviously, seven and a half, eight yards. I can NFL next generation stats here, but this is about um, eight yards. And when Taylor takes another step and gets a really clear view of him, Okay, now at this five to six yards away type zone, when, when uh, Taylor's on about the 12, 12 and a half yard line here, he already, um, this region, he knows what it is that he's getting here from uh, what would be number 39, Levi Wallace, okay? Like you can even see where Wallace is looking. You can see where Wallace is headed, what his bearing angle may be, and Taylor is able to coordinate and control his movement solution in accordance to this. If we look at his position here, we can see him already beginning to cut onto his left. He's giving that head nod and shake. He's really selling that he's going right here. He's selling that he's going this way, right? Or at least at probably that one of those types of angles. And that gets Wallace trying to attack him at that angle here. Okay. So now, right now, I'm not drawing from a perceptual gaze uh, or visual array standpoint. I'm drawing their directions that they're implying that they are moving. Instead, because of the controllability, the parameterization, if you will, of Taylor's actions, he just snaps his left foot down, leans a little further to his left, gets this big restitution of energy, Okay, to get some more power to that outside left foot and watch him just cut onto the um, from outside in now on that crossover type of action. Don't miss the nuances here. And, and I want to point something out. Look at this now. Okay, you can see how hot 39 was coming in, how hot Wallace was coming in, and he's in Never Never Land. There's, there's nothing that he can do to a sort of adapt and still come up with a functional solution now, okay? So let's just take a few frames back, okay? Watch this, snap that left foot down and look at 39. Now has to hit on the brakes. He has to sit and coil, but it's too late. Watch this unfold, boom, okay? It doesn't look like it's that much space, but as you're about to see on the, on the uh, video from the other angle, it actually is more space afforded to Taylor to bring it onto the inside um, than what he initially thought. This was all made possible, guys and gals, by a couple of different things. So a couple of qualities shining out. First, we have to think about the problem's constraints, the states of organization here of the problem. Look at this space, okay? Look at, look at this huge amount of space. And I didn't even do justice to that. Okay. This is all space that uh, Taylor has to his disposal. There is nobody else but Wallace. Wallace in this type of space, really even inside the numbers quite considerably, he's on the hashes. So this is a lot of yardage for Wallace to cover. He knows that if Taylor gets to the outside, it's a done deal. 
Whereas Wallace is acting in a way that hopefully tries to force him back to the inside where at least he has some buddies, okay? But there isn't just a lot there in this first local movement problem. So as we see Wallace's movement behaviors unfold here, he just tries to force him back to the inside. He does go to the inside, but Wallace cannot organize any sort of functional adaptive solution. And as this unfolds, we kind of take this up and, and set this up into the successive affordances that are going to be presented to Taylor. What does that mean? It means that how he solves this initial problem, this first local micro problem, will dictate or be dictated by how he is aiming to solve the second movement problem, only exclusive to the most attuned and adaptable movers, guys and gals. The most skillful movers are the only ones who are doing this. I'm thinking very, very, very small number of guys, okay? Think Barry Sanders, think Marshall Falk, think LaDainian Tomlinson, think these types of guys at this position, okay? Very few guys do we actually see how they solve one problem being determined by how they could potentially solve the next problem. And I do believe that we're seeing this evolution here from Taylor. Brings it back to the inside. Now let's look at some things, okay? He's already perceptual, uh, excuse me, perceptual gaze if I can get my arrow, okay? Bingo, somewhere out in here. This is of course, if he was going to be anchoring his perceptual gaze somewhere to still be able to pick it up. Um, but I believe that this is more, you know, obviously more of a visual array which is gonna allow him to pick up numerous information sources, potential information sources that are potentially specifying in different ways. A couple things here, okay? I know I keep saying that. We see Ryan Kelly, look at me put my star here. I'm sorry that that kind of blends in. We've got a couple of stars here for Ryan Kelly, number 78, his teammate. And if we think about what Taylor may have been anchoring or where or what was determining his anchoring it's right here off screen okay and it's coming in the form of number 23 micah hyde okay um, very pertinent to that which what is unfolding but what we see here now is that taylor obviously has moved on to this second problem he knows that number 20 or 39, excuse me, Levi Wallace is not a threat any longer, even though it still appears, appears to be so. He has more threat coming from guys like this, okay? 99, 91, even some of these guys up here in this mess in traffic probably present more of a threat right now than Wallace. And uh, Taylor knows that, feels that, okay? And right here, I, I want you to think his sole intention now, again, guys and gals, a lot of space here. Okay, he's on the, just on the inside of the numbers. Okay, it's a lot of space to defend. This isn't really that complex of a problem, if you will, because, or at least not that intense of a problem, right? And when I talk about intensity or complexity, complexity being the numerous interacting component parts, there are fewer interacting component parts within this micro problem, right? Um, there are also less intense um, movement problems being presented to Taylor right now. And the reason why I say that is we don't even see a defender uh, right now between he and the goal line. So he's got all of this space to work with. And as you're about to find, just like he just put Levi Wallace on a string, he is now about to put... Um, He's now about to put Micah Hyde on a string as well and just kind of play with him, okay? And we see that unfolding from Taylor's behaviors. You can't really see him right now as we'll be able to as well from the other view, but you can see his center of gravity raised up. He's starting to go into this little extra skipping um, action. He's doing that. Now we see Micah Hyde come into the come into the picture, Micah Hyde, good tackler in space, but this is just too much space and too good of running back in the open field. Right here, Micah Hyde comes into the mix and we see, and I think it becomes pretty obvious, okay? Perception, okay? Perception, where is Hyde? How is Hyde behaving? What are his kinematics telling me? How fast is he coming? When will we intersect? Um, so on and so forth. He's not doing calculations, he being Taylor. I don't believe he's doing calculations per se from a problem solving standpoint, but he's directly picking up this information because of how 
learning has been, how that learning has been direct for him, how that perception is now being taken in an online format or fashion. Okay. Um, and if you don't agree with me, we can fight. Okay. Uh, because I, I think it's quite obvious that he's not doing mental calculations. Like he's some sort of beautiful mind at a, at a chalkboard. The chalkboard happens to be his palette. That is this field. And he's just expressing with his movement in a really deceptive and creative way. Let me go back one more time and show this to you just yet again, before we get to the other view center of gravity raises the skipping action gets hide right here. Okay. Slowing down this deceived into wondering to himself, like there's an information overload. Where's Taylor going? It looks like he might be coming right at me. Is he going to go to the inside? Is he going to go to the outside? It is just too indeterminate of a system right now for Micah Hyde. Okay. Micah Hyde has too much information. The information or the signal of that information that he's connecting to, um, it is a little clouded. So his judgment gets clouded. His decision-making gets clouded and his perceptions, intentions, and actions are clouded. But while that is happening, now Jonathan Taylor himself, don't think that he's just out there deceiving. He's not just moving for movement's sake. What he is doing at this moment in my mind and perspective, telling this movement problem solving story is this. He is deceiving to act, but as he's deceiving, he's continually perceiving. And as he perceives, it's just giving, or as he acts, it's just giving him more time to perceive, meaning to detect the information about how Hyde is behaving. And he just realizes right now, he being Taylor, options, options galore. Okay. He sits and coils just a little bit out of that skipping action, which as you're going to see from the other few changes, hides uh, movement behaviors ever so slightly. He slows down his center of gravity dips and that opens up. Oh my goodness. Space upon space, upon space, upon space, right? So Taylor, because of the way that he behaved in a masterful, functionally fit fashion, yet adaptable. Um, he obviously has Hyde dead to rights. So as we're going to see from the other viewpoint, there's something else that we should talk about here, which is this little hop stop. You can't see it as well here, but we're about to see it on another view. So maybe I'll just let this play through once and then we'll go ahead. That, that acts in a hesitation type of fashion. He gets hesitation for himself and his own actions, but then he gets hesitation from Hyde, which then puts him in this extra position to be stiff armed to the ground. Okay. All from the hop stop, all from his deceiving to act in that given way. Let's go ahead and get our video uh, a little bit forward here. Uh, possibly, maybe. So I'll let this play through. Okay. We can see the perception. We can see space, but we can see uh, leans and sells that outside move on that first local problem. Like he's going, remember guys and gals, like he's going this way. And it looks like he still is going that way or could go that way. Think about how quickly, how rapidly this is unfolding in the real world. Okay. We're going through at 50% and pausing frame by frame. Think about how quickly this is unfolding in the real world. Extraordinary. Okay. Um, and let me get my, um, that was a long, um, uh, get my, uh, highlighter back here. We're about to see again, uh, Levi Wallace come into the mix. Watch this. Oh man, that long extended, um, hop stop from Wallace. Not good. You got to stay tighter, closer, lower to the ground. This is where biomechanics sometimes do matter. Uh, and your movement strategy can put you in a place or position. Like I mentioned earlier, that space from the sideline view, if we would have only been looking at it from that view, wouldn't have told us the story. There's a lot of space here, okay? And right now, if you were to just look at this still shot, you're thinking to yourself, okay, Wallace still has a chance. But if you were to actually look at it in a dynamic unfolding way, realize Wallace has very, very, very little chance. Gets his arms around Taylor, but Taylor is a big, strong, strapping guy. It's not like, you know, he's, he's ankle tackling he's he's trying to wrap his waist but 
Taylor has already had too much momentum build up and he's a strong dude, powerful dude. He's focused and concerned. What's out here? Okay. Where am I going to go? What could I potentially do? That This is what he's thinking to himself um, at this moment. He's detecting information about what's next. Um, I don't think he's worried too much about Wallace at this moment. So as he does this and he slips his tackle, this is what I was talking about now with this hop stop. This, look at, watch him change his center of gravity and hop, land right into it, okay? He hops and lands and in mid-flight of this hop, still has enough interpersonal distance, this metastable region and zone. You guys have heard me talk about it in the past. I'm talking about the range and distance, the interpersonal distance that is created right here, okay? Between this dyadic system the opponent on one side of that, uh, of one side of that relationship and the mover or the, the, the evader here in this case, who is on the other side of that. Let me go back one, just watch this again. Watch the way that he acts. Remember what I mentioned before, that hesitation and in, into that hop stop gives him options. It also creates hesitation from Hyde and it also gives Taylor more opportunity to take in information. So in the midst of, of that flight, in the midst of that high center of gravity and coming down almost floating in gazelle-like fashion or in a, a hummingbird type of fashion, he's floating down. He takes in that information and now he has uh, understood how he must adapt his actions. Guys, look at the position he was in there. Oops, sorry about that. Let me get back here. I want you to think about this position technical model for change of direction? Yes or no? <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think if we were to be looking at this in isolation, in a reduced fashion, we would not write home to mom about Jonathan Taylor's biomechanical execution, Jonathan Taylor's motor system degrees of freedom. But what we would write home to mom about is Jonathan Taylor's integrated movement problem solving process the intertwined interwoven nature of his perceptions, intentions, and actions, and how he utilizes those strategies and adapts the solution to fit the problem. Okay, that hop stop is nifty. Okay, gives him just enough space and opens up the opportunity for him to be able to put his hand right on the helmet of my God. Okay. Now, a few things for us to think about. Like in any play on movement plays of the week, when we're talking about dexterity, guys and gals, we find that we have adaptability within adaptability. The more skilled movers, the more dexterous movers are almost always adapting. And they may do so in novel fashions, right? They may do so um, in ways that look unique to not only that moment in time, but also even maybe unique to other running backs and also possibly unique to them, okay? But the thing about those most dexterous movers is because of their connection to the information and because of their intentionality, their openness, their responsiveness, they're able to adapt with an adaptability in a functional fashion. Now, how would we go about facilitating that? Like I mentioned earlier, I think we need exposure. We need exposure to changing environmental conditions. We also need to find ways to attack the abundance of the movement strategies and the potential solutions. And finally, um, it's there that we can explore um, a variety of those solutions and strategies, but the way they fit to a live movement problems. So what I would actually do is something very similar to that, which what we saw on the entirety of the play. In that simultaneous and successive affordance perception and action, I typically will utilize one V1 plus one type of action activities, okay? A learning activity, a problem that is designed in a way where a player gets a ball 10, 12, 15 yards from a goal line to gain or a yard to gain. And maybe they're starting on the right hash. Maybe they're starting in the center of that space. Maybe they're starting on the left. Repetition without repetition, no two problems the same. From there, 
usually have a defender on say the five um, yard line, let's say it's a 10 yard workspace, 10 yards long, uh, maybe by 10 yards wide, player starting in the corner, like what we saw today. Um, uh, first defender starting five yards away. Uh, maybe there's a teammate for the offensive player in front of, of that defender waiting to get in his way to, to block him off, so on and so forth. So that offensive skill player has to become attuned and adaptable, oriented around that. And then another player, 10 yards away, maybe 15 yards away. So it's these perception action couplings, this information movement coupling through levels. So again, we're creating a landscape of opportunities that have a wide range of potential opportunities to detect, to select upon, and ultimately act upon. And it's a totally alive then in that way. Maybe the person is, we're doing some tag off stuff instead of tackles, but obviously the performer who has the ball must become awfully attuned to these unfolding interactions that exist in front of him. And as those actions of those opponents and potentially teammates unfold, they're able to act accordingly um, in creative, adaptive, novel, but also functional type of fashions. And from there, we can look to educate attention, intention, and, and try to calibrate towards that information. So they really get an opportunity to become one with that problem, as we always talk about, to allow that solution to truly find its functional fit to the problem. Just like Jonathan Daler did on touchdown number four or five um, on the respective day. Um, for this week's Movement Play of the Week, I'm Sean Mishka from Football Beyond the Stats. Remember, if this is your first time here, hit the like button. Maybe if it's not your first time here, still hit the like button. Um, obviously subscribe. And if there's anything that you guys saw that I missed, please feel free to put it in the comments. Um, if, you, if there's questions that you have in regards to certain concepts that I brought up, obviously feel free to leave them in the comments as well. Guys and gals, thank you for your time once again today. Obviously, a lot of layers and intricacies. I uh, hope you enjoy your Thanksgiving um, Day holiday. Hopefully, you and yours uh, keep yourself safe, and I'll talk to you again in week 12.